Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. My guest this week is Dr. Jack Munns. Jack obtained a Bachelor of Science in Botany from Colorado State University while working as a lab assistant facilitating the development of genetic markers for invasive species. Jack then earned a Master of Science from Illinois State University, where he worked towards increasing vegetable oils and temperate grasses like corn for biodiesel production using targeted gene expression. He also has a PhD in Botany from the University of British Columbia, during which he worked to unravel the genetic regulation of nitrogen starvation responses in plants with next-gen sequencing technologies. Jack is now applying his experience in plant molecular genetics to diagnose viruses in cannabis with Three Rivers Biotech based out of Vancouver, Canada. Three Rivers Biotech also has a lab in Ferndale, Washington, and a future lab in California later this year. Hey, Jack, thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to talk to you today. Yeah, let's start off telling listeners a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I uh, have a doctorate in in botany, but I've been working in uh, plant molecular genetics for a little over 10 years now. I've worked on a variety of different projects, but um, I have a a really broad skill set in the uh, molecular genetics field and so that's sort of my core competency uh, so now i've been working on diagnosing viruses uh, so the the most sensitive way to do that will be uh, using genetic diagnostics such as, as pcr so i'm, I'm working um, with three rivers biotech to develop a platform to help uh, specifically ham- have their, sorry hemp and cannabis growers um, to diagnose viruses uh, and we're sort of expanding our platform to uh, include other plants as well yeah, so the reason I wanted to have you on the show today was to talk about your experience with viruses that you're seeing in cannabis and sort of um, simplify the, the science behind uh, not just the testing process, but also the, um, the virus itself, um, or the viruses, I guess I should say. Um, you know, anecdotally, a lot of people for a while there, it seems like, you know, if I go back historically, everyone, the big plant problem was spider mites, and then we moved on to like broad mites, hemp russet, cannabis aphids, and I'm hearing a lot more about viruses. Uh, For a while, everything was being blamed on uh, TMZ or tobacco mosaic virus. But kind of take me through a little bit about about viruses in general, and then uh, a little bit more about what you're seeing in cannabis. Absolutely. Yeah, so the first thing is, it's one of those problems that you can't um, diagnose just based on the symptoms alone. So a lot of viruses will have overlapping symptoms. Um, and so if you go into a field and you see something that's a virus-like symptom, such as leaf mosaic or chlorosis um, or stunting, you can you can easily mix them up just on a, on a visual diagnostics. You have to rely on molecular diagnostics, which then sort of is part of the reason why it's taken a while to catch up in the cannabis field specifically. Um, so not having sort of the academic researchers do some of the basic research to figure out what viruses might be out there has sort of hampered um, our knowledge of what's been in cannabis. Um, however, there are some reports that go back in hemp to, to the early 70s. Um, and then recently, there's a big pickup in that. But I do expect there will be more uh, viruses on the horizon that are found in cannabis as, as researcher or researchers are able to um, open the door to that now with, with the legalization and regula- regulations being a little easier. Um, so you had mentioned TMV a lot of times gets blamed. And I think so, so in, in hemp and cannabis, it's actually been found to be symptomless regarding morphological features. So it was back in 1970, uh, the paper by Paulson et al., who who basically um, infected hemp with a variety of common viruses, and then basically studied to see if hemp displayed any symptoms. And they found that while TMV could infect the the cannabis plant, uh, it didn't actually cause any obvious morphological symptoms. Um, And so they could then spread the virus, but there weren't any any major uh, phenotypes associated with um, or, or pathogenicity, sorry, pathogenesis associated with TMD. Um, it's something that I think deserves a little bit further study. Uh, for example, a plant could be symptomless 
uh, morphologically, but may have uh, changes in, in metabolites or something like that. Um, so I think one of the reasons this has sort of become so prominent recently in, in cannabis specifically is, is the um, the findings of things like hoplatin viroid, which is pretty widespread, and we're seeing a lot of that uh, in the Pacific Northwest. It's sort of the main thing we diagnose. Uh, but then there's a lot of common viruses uh, that are known you know, across agricultural platforms worldwide that have, have become, uh, we, they, they are able to infect cannabis uh, and cause symptom uh, infections, you know, such as, as uh, leaf mosaics, chlorosis, necrosis, dwarfing of the plant, and uh, abnormal growth. Um, so it's definitely a uh, growing field for cannabis, and it's definitely a um, a resource now that we have tools that we, we've developed here, um, and, and there's other tools available out, out in the, um, the community for, for, for growers to begin actually figuring out whether or not they're dealing with something that is virus-related. Um, and so they're often introduced to facilities um, via something like aphids. That's sort of the initial infection, but most commonly they're spread um, through clonal propagation and pruning that's just not been, um, you know, sterilization standards maybe maybe are a little lax. So um, typically they're spread via mechanical transmission uh, via you know, from, from one facility to another of like a clone that came from an infected mother or something like that. Um, or, or spread within a facility uh, if, if pruning tools are not sterilized between, uh, between plants. So what I'm hearing are the main vectors are uh, insects or yep. potentially um, the sharing of clones. What about the risk? Like I know with TMV in other crops, I've heard it's a big issue and like you can't even have a cigarette or be around anything um, related to the tobacco plant. Yeah. Uh, just because of that risk um, in yeah. certain crops. So um, how how common is it for people to spread it through clothing, touching, um, things like right. that? So it depends, highly dependent on the virus or viroid. Um, but TMV is known to be perhaps the, uh, yeah, maybe the most stable of all the viruses. It's very, very stable. Uh, and it can and just be dormant for for a very long period of time, such as, like you said, cigarettes. Um, now it's not the smoke from cigarettes, but it's the touching of the cigarettes. And so there's no main vector known for TMV per se. It's mostly by mechanical transmission, so touch-based transmission, uh, but it can also be spread on seed coats. Um, so again, it's sort of touching the seed. And so now that, that seed, when it germinates, has sort of a reservoir of TMV present. Um, so yeah, for TMV, it's very stable. But then there's other viruses like cucumber mosaic virus, which is very unstable or instable, sorry. Um, so cucumber mosaic virus really only lasts for, I think it's a, in vitro, it's only stable for, for a matter of, of minutes to hours. Um, so that one's a, a virus that when it's transmitted, it's, it's what's called non-persistent. So it's, um, it's not circulating in the insect. But if it's sort of like, you know, I guess sort of like an insect lipstick, you know, if it goes from an infected plant with cucumber mosaic virus, it gets it on its mouth part. Um, and then when it moves to another plant within minutes to hours, um, it can transmit the, uh, actually, I think it's within seconds to minutes for, for cucumber mosaic. Uh, it can spread it to another plant. Um, however, there's other viruses that are more stable and, and then are persistent or semi-persistent in insects. Um, and can either be in the insect for hours or days or within the insect for months to its entire lifetime. So it depends, highly dependent on the virus. So each virus sort of has a different stability. Um, but going back to your original point, yeah, TMV is, is very, very stable virus. So what, so it does vary quite a bit. One question I had kind of related to this then is you mentioned, which I thought was really interesting, uh, that TMV doesn't display any morphological or so any, you know, noticeable physical uh, yeah. changes or structure in the plant itself. Um, I, could you speculate then that most plants potentially could have TMV? I mean, there seems to be a high uh, overlap between smoking uh, cigarettes and smoking cannabis uh, to a certain extent. And so would many plants be exposed? But if that was the case, then I would think... Um, you know, if, if it had any effect, my thought would be when you did a tissue, tissue culture with plants, um, you would see an improvement in yield or a change in morphological structure due to the removal of TMV. Does that make sense? Right. And, 
Yeah, so I, I think it's a little early. Um, so when I say there's no morphological symptoms, there's no obvious, you know, there's no obvious leaf mosaic that was found with TMV regarding hemp. Now, that was back in the 70s. Again, this is sort of a burgeoning field of research that it would be wonderful to, to enlist some more. You know, I know, I know of I have quite a few professors that are working on hemp and cannabis now. Um, but, yeah, it'll, it'll be great to have, like you said, a, a TMV-infected plant that you can measure, you know, do a COA and, and check all the metabolites and, and, and sort of get a real fine, you know, granular detail of a plant and then cure the plant of TMV, whether, um, you know, tissue culture is probably the, the best because then you can have a genetically identical version that you can then compare clean versus not clean and see if there's any significant differences. Um, so, yeah, the, the when I say it's not symptomatic in, in, in uh, hemp and cannabis right now, the only evidence would be anecdotal. There's no scientific literature that would say that there's a morphological change from TMV. Um, but, yeah, I think the science, it, it would, the science has some catching up to do regarding um, some of those, those efforts. But, uh, yeah, so TMV and then going to the other point, um, would a lot of plants be, be having, you know, non or asymptomatic TMV infections circulating? So far, we haven't seen a high incidence of that in, in, in a lot of our testing. Um, that's not to say it isn't out there. Uh, however, TMV is still going to need, um, so while it is transmitted by touch, it's still going to need a wound or some sort of entry into the plant. Um, so when insects infect plants, it's, it, they cause a wound, and then the virus, which is circulating either in their gut or salivary glands or on their mouth parts, is then um, inserted into that wound. So when it's, you know, when we have these spread of infections in facilities, it's often because of poor sterilization practices with, with pruning tools or leaving uh, cut, you know, cut, cut plant material um, that might have phloem, you know, sap uh, that's available to then transmit to another wound. Um, so as far as like having TMB circulate because of that, uh, provided, you know, if, you're, if you go for a smoke break, touching a cigarette, come back, so long as you're not touching a wound on a plant, that wouldn't necessarily um, confer an infection. Uh, but yeah, so far we haven't had, you know, I mean, the overwhelming amount of positives we've had have been for hoplite and thyroid and not necessarily for, um, so our, our TMB positives have been relatively low. That's really interesting. So if we, um, if we table that discussion for yeah. now, since there's not a lot more on TMV, uh, you, you know, yeah. you, you mentioned hops, late, hops latent virus a couple times. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about some of the symptoms associated with it? Um, you talked yeah. about mode of transmission. Um, one, one question I had then, this seems to be a, a good reason not to uh, keep any of your leaf matter or biomass in the room itself and um, also potentially avoid having other plants that could be vectors for viruses in the room too, as in cover crops or and just be very careful with banker plants, trap plants, things like that. Right. Yeah. So yeah, that's a great point about trap plants. And, um, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a good practice in theory, but yeah, if you, you just have to be careful with, um, with the spread of possibly, you know, you know, an aphid going from a trap plant or something like that to, um, to, a, to one of your, your crop plants. Um, so this is something to be aware of. Um, and regarding just the, the, the plant matter, you know, as clean as you can keep it, the better. Uh, obviously, I know, you know, the larger the facility is, the harder it can be to, to have all of the, the, the floors swept routinely. I mean, those get pruned fairly frequently. Um, but anything that has, you know, flow and sap could be a potential reservoir for a virus infection. Um, so, yeah, so the hop latent. So hop latent is interesting. It's not a virus. It's a viroid. Um, so there is a hop latent virus, but that's uh, not been found to infect cannabis. It's a uh, specific, I think, to hops only. But um, the viroid is, uh, they're unique from viruses in that they don't have any protein coding regions of their genome. And their genome is, is incredibly tiny. It's about 1 20th the size of a plant virus. So these are tiny pieces of RNA that's circular. They don't code for any proteins or anything like that. Um, and so they're sort of uh, insidious in that regard is that they, um, they don't, they, they, they can, they can get into a plant uh, relatively easily because they're so small. Um, so any, any sort of wound infection they can get in. Um, so far, I don't 
think that it's, it's primarily by mechanical injury that, that they're transmitted. So hoplitin viroid and viroids in general um, typically are primarily transmitted by mechanical injury. Um, so, you know, the, the exchange of phloem sap. However, they can be transmitted through seeds, pollen, uh, and ovules. Um, so hop latent viroid, this is the kind of sort of academic study that I'd love to see done in, in cannabis. But in hops, um, hop latent viroid was very minimally transmitted by seed. I think it was less than, uh, it was about 8% in the publication that was in 1990. Um, and so hop latent viroid is very low seed transmission in hops. Uh, however, that said, um, the two ways to get rid of it would be either either seed um, or tissue culture. And the seed method, you should be aware that it's possible that it's still there. So you should just carefully, um, you know, proceed with caution if you're if you're going to try and get rid of hop latent viroids via um, via via breeding. Uh, as far as symptoms, so the things that you're looking for are typically going to be stunted or slow growth is sort of the main one, and so. Um, we see a lot of horizontal growth, and so the the, the shoot apical meristem seems to, to not grow very much, and you get this lateral growth, and so it kind of looks like, you know, depending on how many branches you have, sort of like a trident almost. You got two long branches on the side and one in the middle. Um, so slow growth. It's really obvious when you compare asymptomatic versus symptomatic crop weight next to each other um, how slow the growth is, um, and it's very horizontal or outward growth. So the stems are typically brittle. So yeah, on, on that note, that's really interesting. So are you saying that you don't see the same level of like phototropism as in the plant growing towards the light or um, no, apical so growth? Still grows, right. Uh, it still grows towards the light. It just sort of um, the lateral branches grow upward and sort of overtake the the, the primary, you know, the shoot apical, uh, apical meristem period apparently. Um, so yeah, it's sort of like this, yeah, as, as I said, sort of a sort of a, a trident-ish shape where the middle one is, is, is lower than the outer two. Um, but they do still grow towards the light, uh, but it is. So your, uh, your secondary branches are growing at a right. faster rate. I'm picturing like a uh, candelabra for people yeah. that are listening because yeah. we can't really have visuals here. Okay. All right. So I, I get what <laughs> yeah, you're saying. Okay. Lines, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, and, and I mean, but overall the, the plant is just much smaller than a uh, asymptomatic infection too. So, um, so it's pretty, it's pretty apparent when you have a really sy a symptomatic hop latent infection. Are and there then, any leaf uh, symptoms? Yeah. Yeah. So we also get uh, malformed or chlorotic leaves. So sort of leaf chlorosis, uh, sort of uh, yellowing or, or pale leaves. Um, and then you have stems that are often brittle, so they can snap when you brush against them. Uh, and then as far as the flower, you get very reduced flower uh, mass. So the, the, the buds are going to be smaller and they're usually very, really leafy. Um, so you get these loose, uh, loose buds that are just a pain to trim. So um, lots of leaves and then the buds, lower trichomes, just sort of lower yield in general. Wow. You um, just yeah, described, <laughs> you just described like every symptom related to anything from watering, <laughs> environment, nutrients. Yeah. Um, man, none of those things are really it's, specific enough. And that's tricky about a lot of viruses is they have really overlapping symptoms. Some of them appear to be, you know, they could be for all intents and purposes, look like a nutrient deficiency. Mm -hmm. um, so chlorosis of leaves, obviously there's a lot of viruses that have like intervenal chlorosis, which could look like a magnesium deficiency, but um, it's not. And, and so one of the things that you need to consider when you're looking at your plants is, is, is the distribution of the symptoms uniform. That is to say, does your entire crop look the exact same. And then you could maybe pinpoint something like a nutrient deficiency, um, or is it sort of irregular, you know, sort of an irregular distribution where one or two plants are, are showing the symptoms, whereas the one next to it may not. Um, so the plants won't always show the symptoms if they have the virus. Uh, so we often get asymptomatic hop uh, viroid infections. And so you'll have an asymptomatic plant next to a symptomatic plant, and there'll be a very clear difference in the uh, size of the growth of the plant, and then one may have the chlorosis, whereas the other does not. So you're right, it can be, you know, I mean, it, it's difficult to just walk in and say, like, that's obviously a virus, unless it's sort of the one plant out of 10. And then you can be like, okay, it's probably a virus, because it's only affecting this one plant. Um, and I don't see any obvious uh, insect or pathogen, such as a fungi. So yeah, it's... Um, 
challenging. <laughs> sure, sure. And just to present a contrarian view there, um, yeah, it could also be, you know, uh, essentially, you know, what you're saying is if you see it in one place in the room, it's more likely to be a virus than something that's affecting, you know, your whole crop. And that allows you to guess maybe it's a it's a virus. Uh, it could also be, you know, a fan, your lighting, the way the airflow is through right. that space. So there's a bunch True. of things you still have to check off. Um, sure. Sure. And it all could also could be uniform in the sense that maybe all your plants are infected. <laughs> it sounds like so. Yeah. Who? Yeah. And, um, yeah. So, yeah. so what do yeah. I do as a grower? Uh, you know, I want to talk about some of these other viruses, but um, yeah. you, you really got me thinking like, okay, if I see something go on in my room, I can't identify it. I want to check virus off the list um, or hops latent in this case. Um, what do we do? Like, what if we were, if we wanted to work directly with you guys at, uh, at Three Rivers, um, how, how yeah. would that work? Yeah, so we have a testing kit that we would send out to you. Uh, so the testing kit is a test tube a uh, small test tube filled with a stabilization buffer. So this, um, the vast majority of plant viruses are single-stranded RNA viruses. And so there's about, I think approximately 75% of known plant viruses are RNA-based. So RNA is not a particularly stable molecule. As I mentioned with cucumber mosaic virus, it's, it's very unstable, so, or unstable. Um, so this buffer helps preserve you know, any viruses or, that may be in the sample. And so when you do the sampling, the, um, if you have symptomatic tissue, you would take a small clip of that symptomatic tissue. So we only need 100 milligrams, uh, somewhere between 50 and 100 milligrams. So for a frame of reference, that's roughly the size of a penny, a nickel, you know, sort of, sort of between a penny and a quarter, I guess, would be the, the range of uh, leaf that you would need to um, chop up. And the more you're able to chop it up into little bits, the better that the stabilization solution can penetrate the tissue and preserve any, any virus that's there. Um, you then put that in the fridge overnight. It, it allows for the, the buffer, again, the stabilization buffer to penetrate the tissue and preserve any uh, RNA viruses that might be there. So then after it's been in the fridge overnight, you would just mail it back to us. Uh, at which point I would then run the, the PCR. Um, so from there, I just extract the RNA um, and we do an RT-PCR to, to test for, for the, uh, to detect any viruses that might be present in that sample. If you don't have symptomatic tissue, but you are concerned of an infection or you're doing routine testing just to be sure, um, you would use young t leaf tissue. So just an emerging leaf um, same protocol from there, 50 to 100 milligrams, so about a penny to a quarter size of the leaf. Close to the petiole is also is also um, better. Um, so these viruses typically travel in the phloem or the plasmodesmata between cells. Um, so they're pretty pretty much going where the nutrients go. So um, oftentimes we find better diagnostics in the young tissue. Uh, that said, I mean if your symptomatic tissue is an older tissue, um, that that we found that works just fine as well. So very small amount of tissue. Because it's from a leaf um, and it's destroyed in this buffer, so there's very, very, it, it's uh, considered hemp for the purposes of delivery um, because there's little to no THC and it's a very small sample. Um, so we don't have any, any um, we haven't had any troubles there. I'm glad you touched on the mail aspect because that was something that I brought up with your colleagues and they mentioned that the sample yeah. is destroyed essentially um, yeah. by the leaf. Yeah, it's a biological that. sample. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so there's no real risk there as far as you guys are concerned. Um, w one question I had is what, what does this sort of thing cost approximately? I know there's a range based on right. volume, but. Um, right. Yeah. So we do offer bulk discounts on, on orders over 10, but um, right now for an individual hop latent test, it's 75 Canadian. So that's about a 20% discount for us customers. So that's um, cause yeah, we are based out of British Columbia, out of uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, but we have a facility, a testing facility in Washington, and we're opening up one in California. Um, the, so yeah, 75 for the hop latent, so that's about 60 US. If you want to do the full virus panel, which we test for eight viruses currently, and that's expanding sort of, you know, we've got our ear to the ground regarding professors working on finding more viruses, and we're looking into some of our cells that, that um, appear to have virus symptoms that don't appear to be one of the major ones that we have so far. So, um, so it's expanding. So we have about eight, yes, we have eight viruses now on the full panel and that costs 150 Canadian. 
which is approximately 120 U.S. Okay, and, uh, you know, how many samples would I need to send in to get a really good idea of if my plants have, uh, you know, a particular virus? Can I send in one right. sample if I think I just see it in one area or if I just want to test a room? I realize sending in one sample of a room that's asymptomatic or, or potentially free isn't really going to, you know, be statistically significant. Right, right. So it's, it's um, so yeah, if you have symptomatic plants, obviously the symptomatic plants should, should be tested. Um, from there, uh, typically, so statistically significant, you'd have to do a lot of testing. To get sort of to a 90 95 percent confidence interval you'd have to do you know a significant amount of testing so mm -hmm. it's it's good to sort of identify where the possible entry points of the infection might be so if you think it came from a mother like if you, if you have a really widespread infection it may be coming from your mother plant so it's good a good place to test um to see if, if you're spreading it through through propagation if you think it came in from sort of an aphid infection, you know, if, if it's only in one part of the facility, uh, plants sort of spread out around that area are, are a great place to start. Um, so if you have a few symptomatic plants, you can start there. And then if you get some, you know, if we find positives, you can then expand the search to figure out the extent of the infection. Uh, one thing that's important to note is that we, with, with a hot latent viroid, sometimes the virus titer is too, is too low. So the concentration of the virus is, 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 there, but it's just too low to detect with even with the most sensitive PCR. So we typically recommend um, that you do multiple tests to ensure a negative. So we have, and it's it's sort of industry practice to do three to four tests um, on a negative to ensure that it's negative. And we try and you know you want to spread those two approximately two weeks apart. Um, so some viruses also are more prevalent in certain stages of plant development. Um, so that's why we use the younger tissues, the younger leaf tissues, because it's, it's sort of one of the best testing locations just from, from other crops um, for, for the development of the plant. But um, so, yeah, so, so going back to your question, it's going to it sort of depends on whether you're seeing symptoms, whether you're just doing a confirmation to assure that your, your facility is clean, um, how big your facility is. Um, but obviously, wherever you're, you're, you're cloning from, your mother stocks, those would probably be your, um, if you have a clean, if you think your facility's clean, um, doing r routine testing on, on those mother stocks is, is a good idea just to make sure that they are clean. And then if you have something like an aphid infection, you should definitely, con you know, I mean, it's, it's worth thinking about whether or not those aphids may have brought in a virus. Um, and so, so testing uh, around where the, the aphid infection was, was first observed, things like that. And then lastly, if you're bringing new genetics in, um, it's really good practice to quarantine those, not put them straight next to your, you know, not, not put them straight into production, but quarantine any new genetics uh, and test those, you know, multiple times just to make sure that they come up negative before putting those into production. Um, so you don't spread, you know, from, from, from a new, new clone or a new variety that you bring in. Okay. You guys are primarily testing plants and veg too. Is that correct? I'm sorry, what was that? You're primarily testing plants that are uh, still in their vegetative state. Um, right, flower. right. Yeah, that's right. primarily what yeah, this is that's for. Right. Yeah, so this is, yeah, primarily for vegetative growth. Um, yeah, please please don't try and send us anything from the flower. Because, um, yeah, the, uh, the the fact that we're using leaf tissue and, and uh, tissue by the petiole, it's very, it's, it's little to no THC, which, which makes it um, hemp for, for regulatory purposes. Um, so yeah, right now we're not doing, so we, we do offer, uh, beyond just virus testing, we do offer fungal testing too for, for PCR identification of certain fungi, but um, we don't, we only do that for vegetative tissues, uh, so root, and, uh, root, stem, and leaf. Okay, yeah, I asked that because, you know, a lot of these things, I know it's really easy to have a healthy looking veg plant, and then a lot of these issues seem to crop up in flower, uh, especially yeah. late flower, that's sort of like the test yeah. for how good of a grower you are in a lot of ways, I feel like. <laughs> So, you know, are we, is it pretty obvious in veg or would like, let's say I, I noticed an issue in flower, would I then go back to my next round of clones and that's where I would want to test and just say, okay, these, these are done. I'm not, I'm not trying to find out if the virus is in these, these, my flowering crop for this cycle. Um, you know, how would you approach that? Got it. Um, yeah. So you can, yeah, you can approach it one of two ways and it's, it's it, the, the way that you had mentioned is uh, not a, not a bad method. So if you think there's a virus and you're you're at the flowering stage, 
um, testing your next uh, batch of, of clones, um, you can start there. We can, you know, we can still test uh, leaf material from a flowering crop. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, I mean, because we're using, you know, so long as it's leaf, you know, far, far away from the, from the flower and the THC content should still be pretty low. Um, but yeah, typically we prefer to test stuff from vegetative plants. So the next round of plants would be, would be a good place to start. Um, regarding the infection levels. So oftentimes, so, so for something like lettuce chlorosis virus, uh, they found that the infected, the infected clones developed symptoms much earlier than the uh, originally, you know, the, the patient zero, so to speak, the, the originally infected mother. Um, so when you are making the clones from whatever plant you, you uh, suspect of a virus, um, you may actually see the symptoms earlier in the next, in the next batch. So um, that's sort of another you know, test, I guess you could say. If, if you did see something virus-like towards the flowering stage, um, you may end up seeing symptoms earlier in the next um, growth cycle or, or the one following that. So these, these, these problems, the level of virus typically uh, compounds over time. And so, yeah, the, uh, as far as the testing goes, we can test either. But, um, you know, before you go through a whole another grow, grow cycle, it's, it's, uh, it's probably a good idea to try and test some of those, those early, early plants from, from the next gen. Okay, and and I know your numbers are probably skewed a little bit because people, um, you know, are, are more likely to reach out if they if they have an issue. But yeah. uh, you know what? Approximately, what percentage do you think uh, of the tests that you guys run come back with some virus or virus? So you're right that our, our testing numbers are skewed um, towards people who think they have symptoms and we are still sort of early um, in our commercial aspect. So we started selling tests back in March. We've been three months in and for growers sending us in, there's only been one time where everything came up negative. Um, so we're typically finding hop latent uh, in, a, in a lot of growers in the Pacific Northwest regarding how many strains um, per um, Regarding how many strains per per grower, it it, it sort of varies um, depending on whether or not they, they have a worse infection um, or not, and just sort of by random sampling and sort of our sampling numbers are probably too small to get any sort of meaningful numbers from there. Um, but yeah, we are seeing you know people that send us send, send symptomatic samples um, all but one so far have come up positive for something, mostly hop latent. So it's pretty prevalent. That's really interesting. Um... <laughs> that just that kind of surprises me a little bit but um yeah and i mean yeah. it really does go to your point that it's sort of skewed at this point because we are you know mostly having people reach out with something that's symptomatic sure but it tells you there's a level of prevalence that's higher than i would have speculated before talking to you um absolutely at least here and in I the think, northwest yeah in the northwest and i mean it's it's known sort of in california too so the west coast i guess and I mean, hop latent viroid is worldwide. I mean, it was found, in, I can't remember when it was originally ID'd in hops. I think it was the 70s or 80s. But, I mean, it has a worldwide distribution. Um, I think this reports of hop latent positives in cannabis coming from, from uh, I think it's New Zealand, too. So it's, it's and we're, we're trying to start doing some testing uh, for, for, you know, other other areas. Um, but it's uh, it's definitely there. And, I mean, part of the problem is that it's not been... You know, because because cannabis is finally coming out of uh, out of the shadow, so to speak, um, we now have the ability to test for it. So previously, you might have just assumed um, some sort of variation due to any number of other other uh, reasons. You know, we had mentioned earlier how it can be um, tricky to just walk in and, and point out a plant and say that one has a virus, um, because a lot of the times the symptoms can overlap with other things. Um, and also the, the symptoms of a virus sometimes don't manifest until an environmental stress occurs. So you may just chalk it up to the environmental stress. And, and before, you know, before now, when things were sort of operating in the shadows, it, it was easier to do that because you didn't even have the tools to test for the viruses. So um, it's not uncommon. I mean, as other industries where, especially with clonally propagated crops, um, until you, until they started looking for viruses, they didn't realize how big the problem was. So, so potato and strawberries are industries um, that had a lot of uh, virus issues uh, prior to, to sort of industry-wide testing practices. So it is somewhat alarming the first time you hear it, um, but it's not really, 
all that unsurprising when you sort of look at sort of the landscape of agriculture and just how uh, sure. how easy it is to accidentally spread these things and, and how, you know, genetics were just sort of being passed around previously. Okay. Okay. So if we see in a forum, someone posts a photo, uh, which, you know, like Facebook or Instagram and, and people start saying, oh, that's TMV, oh, that's hop latent viroid, you can pretty much... Uh, shut them down and tell them there's no way they could possibly know that from a, from a picture. It actually takes genetic testing. Is that right? Yeah. So you could, yeah. So molecular testing. So you can also do uh, not for hop latent viroid, but for some viruses, you can do protein testing. It's less sensitive. Uh, it's called ELISA. So it's an enzyme linked immunoabsorbent. I forget all the letters. Um, <laughs> spectroscopy. So it's a chlorometric assay that basically measures um, the amount of protein, virus, viral protein present in a sample. But essentially, you, um, have to, you have to send it into a lab, I guess, is what, I'm, yeah, what I want yeah. to get at, out to people <laughs> yeah, yeah. so that they don't, yeah. uh, they don't fall for that, I guess, in that regard. Um, right. There I mean, are, I mean, I think there's one symptom, the leaf mosaicism, that one's pretty, I mean, there's very few causes of, of sort of that kind of variegation in a leaf other than a virus. So that one, but I mean, then you don't know which virus um, because lots of viruses cause leaf mosaics. Um, and, and we don't see that. We haven't have any scientific literature to see that in TMV yet. Can that be genetic though too? Or is that always viral related? So there are tropical plants that are naturally variegated with sort of a mosaic like leaf. Um, but it's very rare for that to be, you know, I mean, as far as, as far as cannabis goes, I, there, there's no reports that I know of, of a specific gene that if, if it gets you know, mutated causes mosaicism. So, um, and even if there was, it would only affect a small portion of the plant um, unless it happened very, 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 very early in that plant's development. It also would only affect that one plant. So to, to chalk it up to genetics is um, far less likely than the odds of a virus. So, okay. and I, it's, it's so, it's so unlikely that you can, you can almost rule it out, but, um, because I don't have any, any scientific information regarding, you know, genes that cause leaf mosaics and cannabis, I, I don't want to just, just sort of, uh, sure, sure. rule it out completely, but. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it's, another it's, I, question I had for you, are you, have you aware of any, uh, viruses that could possibly cause a plant to hermaphrodite or produce seeds in a female plant? That's a great question. Um, so I don't know of any particular virus that would cause that. However, you know, I mean, hermaphroditism, sorry, hermaphroditism. That's why I avoided that often, word. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a tough one. Um, it's, it's often triggered by environmental stressors. Um, so, you know, I mean, there's certain strains that are more predisposed, predisposed, oh man, I'm struggling with words, predisposed to hermaphrodites than others. Sure. Um, but still, it usually takes an environmental cue to trigger that. Um, so the virus, if you had a viral infection, it could make the plant more stressed and result in that. But at this point, you know, I don't have any scientific data to back that up. Um, it's going to be... I think that'll be an interesting area of study for, for some of these academic institutions that are working on cannabis now. Hmm. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you, we've talked a little bit about hops latent and, uh, uh, TMV. Are there other viruses that you, you know, you'd like, or viroids that you think are worth highlighting? Uh, yeah. I mean, so the, I mean, okay, so there's a whole group um, of viruses. The viroids, so far, there's no other viroid um, found in cannabis as of yet. Uh, there's only 40, roughly 40 viroids worldwide. Um, it's sort of another area sort of growing uh, now, now that people are looking for it with next-gen sequencing. Um, but for viruses, um, the ones that we know are symptomatic um, would be, so alfalfa mosaic virus causes leaf mosaicism and stunting. Uh, it's a pretty common virus. So, you know, agriculturally, that one's relevant. Um, cucumber mosaic virus is another, you know, worldwide distribution virus, very common in the agricultural field. Um, cucumber mosaic has been shown to cause leaf mosaic and dwarfing in cannabis. Um, these are, you know, so alfalfa mosaic and cannabis, or sorry, alfalfa mosaic and cucumber mosaic uh, both can be transmitted by aphids, um, but then also me mechanical transmission. 
Um, and so uh, I think, you know, I mean, uh, the, the transmission mode is, is important here because if you have an aphid infection, then you might have, you know, alfalfa mosaic or cucumber mosaic. Uh, lettuce chlorosis virus has been found in cannabis recently in Israel. Uh, so far, we haven't had any positives here for lettuce chlorosis, and I don't know of any North American lettuce chlorosis virus in cannabis. However, lettuce chlorosis virus was originally found in lettuce in California, um, so we're sort of on the lookout for that one. Um, but the different, you know, lettuce chlorosis virus, the initial infection, the natural infection is by white flies, um, so that's sort of a less common vector uh, for us in the cannabis field. So that one, um, you know, unless we, we get, uh, I think it's in, in hotter climates, tropical climates that have sort of more white fly uh, problems. Um, but in the greenhouse, I don't know if that one's going to be, you know, we haven't seen it yet. So lettuce chlor chlorosis virus is something that causes uh, stunting in early development. Um, but if it's a later, later infection than yellowing, chlorosis, um, some necrosis, drooping foliage, foliage, so just sort of a, a sad plant. Um, there's, I think in the, in the Southwest, um, they're starting to see more beet curly top virus. So this one's a little different than most plant viruses. This one's a DNA-based uh, virus, not an RNA-based one. But that one's transmitted initially by leaf hoppers. So that's sort of a specific vector to sort of tropical regions also so they're hot drier drier areas so the southwest uh, i think in colorado they have uh, more beet curly top virus than, than elsewhere um the beet curly top is going to cause symptoms that are again sort of you know similar to most it's uh, you know leaf chlorosis leaf curling the yellowing of leaves necrosis um so yeah a lot of these viruses have sort of overlapping symptoms um but there's there's some other major ones, the tobacco streak virus, tobacco ring spot virus. They know to cause symptoms in cannabis. Uh, but so far, these other viruses, we've seen a much lower positive rate for. So um, they haven't been as prevalent. Um, but for tobacco ring spot virus, that one's transmitted by nematodes. So this will be soil soil-based vector. Uh, so it's not as likely in a greenhouse to get a, a natural infection for tobacco ring spot. It's more of an outdoor grow problem. Um, but it, again, all of these viruses can be transmitted mechanically. So if you're, if you're, if you're not sterilizing your, your pruning tools effectively, you can transmit or spread it um, if it already exists in a plant. So this, this means if you are working on one plant, you want to sterilize your equipment before moving to, to the next plant. Um, and it's, it's pretty common practice in right. you know, a lot of yeah. horticultural situations that I don't see carried out as, as prevalently in um, cannabis. Yeah, so we definitely encourage, uh, strongly encourage our, our, our clients and growers to, to sort of take on some of those common practices from other agricultural industries such as that. Um, that's you know, the, the, the lack of sort of um, sterilization is probably how some of these things spread in the first place. And, and so doing sort of due diligence to try and limit the spread. Um, that way, if you do get a natural infection, which is less common, you know, mo the, the primary mode of infection we're seeing is mostly just from clonal propagation and spreading it around. So the natural infections seem, seem less common. And so if you're doing the due diligence of sterilizing your tools between plants and you're not spreading it, uh, limiting the infection, then, then uh, you stand a better chance of, of, of keeping these things sort of out of your facility. And then once you're in, once they are in your facility, um, it's, it's relatively easy to manage once you sort of put in these sort of sterile practices to avoid spreading it um, and cleaning up your genetics, either with TC or, or bringing in new clean genetics. Um, so they're totally manageable if you do end up getting a positive, which is another thing I sort of like to mention with people who do uh, end up having a positive is it's not, you know, it's not time to, to, to panic. It's, it's just, it's, it takes some time to clean things up, but um, uh, it's, it's totally manageable. Now in other crops, do you see uh, resistance to viroids in specific cultivars or varieties? Um, is that mm -hmm. a possibility in cannabis? Yeah, so, so for viruses, absolutely. Um, there are certain uh, cultivars that may have higher levels of resistance to a natural infection. Um, 
Yeah. So the, again, this is, <laughs> I guess probably said this a lot, but it's one of those areas that would be, it's going to be really, really wonderful to have academic institutions begin to take up some of this research because, um, it is entirely possible, but it takes a lot of, you know, a lot of effort and, and research money to, to sort of hunt down any cultivars that might have improved resistance. Um, so you can sort of see that as sort of a fishing expedition where you're going out in the world and trying to find any, any cultivar that might have improved resistance to a, to a natural infection. Um, the alternative, which a lot of industries use, is genetic you know, modification to, to just skip all the fishing and just improve resistance right away. Um, but obviously there's a lot of, you know, sort of, uh, backlash to that still. Um, so naturally finding strains that are resistant. I know there's efforts for fungal pathogens. I know of an effort, um, to find resistance for powdery mildew at a, at a, at a academic institution that's working on that. Uh, essentially what they do is they, um, they take a resistant cultivar that, that doesn't have as frequent of an infection. Uh, and then they can do genome-wide association studies. So they, they look at the genome and, and try and find um, obvious um, similarities among those that are resistant compared to those that are not. And try and figure out, you know, gene or genes. Usually it's multiple genes, but try and find uh, reasons why, you know, tra those traits are, are conferred. Um, so it's totally possible. It's sort of a longer-term, you know, hope and project that uh, definitely requires sort of the enlistment of um, sort of academic institutions to do some of the basic research behind that. Uh, to sort of uh, speed it along, but yeah, it's possible. Um, viroids, so viruses, viruses have you know sort of three steps to their infection. You know, it's the uh, the entry to the cell, whether it be by an insect or other, uh, and then releasing their protein coat, which releases the genome into the cell, and then replication of that genome uh, by most often by plant proteins will replicate the genome um, by, you know, just by happenstance. Uh, some, some plant viruses can replicate their own genome, um, but it's, it's fewer, I believe. And then from there, it's, it's, trans it's moving itself from one cell to another. And so those three steps, you can, you can have traits of the plant that are able to stop it in its tracks. Um, one of the main ways that plants do this is, um, by silencing the RNA of the virus. So, so they have uh, a way to recognize double-stranded RNA and target it for either de degradation or prevent it from being trans translated into a protein. Um, so that's sort of the method that, that's most commonly employed in genetic engineering is, is, uh, is improving the silencing specific to a virus. Um, so it, it depends on the virus and how it's being moved from cell to cell and things like that as to, to where you want to stop it in its tracks and how there might be traits that you can select for. Viroids, a little different because they don't, they're so tiny, the viroids can enter small, they can, viroids can travel sort of cell to cell um, via phloem and, and, and plasma does not without the same problems that viruses incur because they're larger. Uh, and then viroids typically reside in the nucleus where the plant host just replicates it. Um, and then it sort of just diffuses from there. Um, there are some viroids that, that exist in the core of blast and are replicated there, but there's less of those, mostly during the nucleus. But um, in order to stop the replication of a viroid, you would need to have um, the RNA silencing mechanism of the plant tailored to, to target that viroid and prevent it from, from, from being replicated. Um, so silence it, essentially. Uh, it's uh, part of what's called the RNA interference um, program in plants. Uh, so they have proteins that can specifically recognize certain sequences um, and, they, and they can uh, silence them from being replicated. So that's sort of the, the method that you would do that for viroids. And I, I mean, you could do it with genetic engineering. I don't know. I have not come across. And I, I could probably look. I, I, I think try, I haven't come across that. I, I think you covered yeah. it. That's getting a little beyond, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, sorry. my yeah. academic level. Um, yeah. So just to, just to kind of cover some of the highlights, uh, you know, from today, just to make sure uh, yeah. people catch it. Um, essentially, these viruses do exist in cannabis. Um, yeah. They are mainly or transported by uh, pests as a vector and also mechanical through like pruners, clippers, humans, things like that. Um, 
if you want to get it tested, you guys offer those, the testing. Um, I'm hoping to work with you guys soon on that. I was on the phone with a couple of your other guys there about getting it set up on our website too. So I'm excited about that, um, Perfect. to offer that to our, our customers. Um, if you do have uh, a virus or viroid in, on your plants, um, your real options there are to take it to seed, which may help, but not is not a foolproof option, or do tissue culture, which is a podcast that I also just recently re uh, recorded with someone from your company as well. Um, and that's yep. really the only surefire way to get uh, a clean plant. Correct. Did yeah, I cover so it? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you covered it all. And then, uh, yeah, just unfortunately, there's just no chemical or, or uh, uh, you know, there's no vaccines for plants. So, um, so yeah, tissue culture and seed are the only way. And some viruses still are transmitted via seed. So depending on what it is, we can we can work with you there um, as, to, as to options. But yeah, that is, that's, that's the gist of it. Oh, and that this is not necessarily something that can be visually diagnosed in a lot of cases. Yeah, yeah, you may have a strong... You, have, you may have some strong supporting evidence that it could be a virus, but you have no idea which one unless you get it tested um, because they often have very similar symptoms across the viruses. Well, how, how important, if we know we have a virus, how important is it that we identify the virus? I mean, does it really matter at that point? Isn't the treatment going to be the same? True. Um, so, you know, immediately, if you think you have a virus, it's best practice to quarantine that plant so it's not spreading any infection to, to neighboring plants. However, um, plants will often go asymptomatic. So if you just remove the symptomatic plant, it doesn't necessarily mean you've re to remove the entire infection in your facility. Um, so getting a positive diagnosis would tell you, A, yes, it's definitely a virus, and then B, you should consider doing some testing on, on neighboring or you know, other plants in that facility um, to see if you have uh, asymptomatic plants there and, and try and get a handle on the spread. Um, so it is still a valuable tool. Um, and then it does give you some information regarding whether or not you can use seed to get rid of it um, or, or you're stuck with TC because some of the viruses are transmitted via seed. Yeah, and I would, I would add, I wouldn't recommend anyone makes an assumption they have a virus. I mean, identifying your problem is something that is the most important thing in terms of figuring out your mode of action or treatment. I mean, I know with insects, Suzanne has drilled into my head that uh, you really have to identify the insect to even know how you're going to approach, uh, you know, solving the problem because the treatments vary so much. Um, I, I would say the same right. with viruses because it could turn out to be some other form of plant stress that just displays in a way that looks similar enough that you may be making the wrong assumption. It's true. Um, it's true. And, and obviously nutrient deficiencies are not really something that um, we expect. You know, I mean, growers usually have a really strong handle on their nu nutrients and things like that. But um, uh, yeah, it, it would it would be um, unwise to just assume um, you have a virus without getting uh, a positive diagnosis from a lab uh, to then, you know, give you full information that you can go forward making the right decisions for your facility. Great. Well, was there anything else that you wanted to share regarding, uh, you know, viruses with our uh, listening audience? No, I think that's about it. All right. Well, hey, I really appreciate your time today. I, I learned a lot and enjoyed the phone call. Um, maybe we can talk again Thank soon you as so you guys, uh, you know, discover more in the, in the world of research here. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on today. I really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, I really appreciate you um, helping us spread the word. And uh, I look forward to talking again when, uh, when we have some more information about what the full scope of, of viruses that are, are threats to cannabis are. So I look forward to talking again in the future. <laughs> That was Dr. Jack Munns, and you are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of KISS Organics. If you are interested in virus testing, you can now find it available on the KISS Organics website under the product section. And don't forget to check out the product page at www.kisorganics.com for links to the websites and topics we covered in the podcast. Just click on the Learn tab, then Podcast. Also, if you haven't already, please take a moment and leave us a comment or review on whatever platform you listen on. I do take the time to read them all and appreciate the feedback. You can also follow us on Instagram at, at KissOrganics to stay up to date on the latest podcast releases and information. Thanks for listening.